so I'm a professor in the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at MIT and a core faculty member at the Broad Institute, where I co-direct uh, the Eric and Wendy Schmidt Center. So this is housed at one of the world's leading biomedical research institutes. Uh, the Eric and Wendy Schmidt Center seeks to create a um, two-way street between machine learning and biology. So our researchers and partners collaborate to make the most important biological questions of our time really key drivers of foundational advances in machine learning and AI, and vice versa, to use machine learning to then go after these really important biomedical questions. And so I'm really thrilled to announce to the Top Coder community this Cancer Immunotherapy Data Science Challenge on reprogramming T cells to combat tumors um, that we're hosting on Top Coder this January. Um, so let me give you a bit of background. So we've, of course, seen a great data revolutions and two great data revolutions in the 21st century. Uh, first, the life sciences are in the midst of a data revolution. Um, inexpensive and accurate DNA sequencing is a reality. Um, advanced molecular imaging is becoming routine. And you know, single cell genomics is allowing us in a single experiment to profile millions of cells together. And so these technological innovations and you know, the massive data sets they produce have brought us really to a threshold of a new era in the biomedical sciences. But you know, with these amazing opportunities come real challenges. Our ability to generate new data is rapidly outpacing our ability to analyze and interpret it. Now, in fact, a single lab can generate a data set that rivals in size the entire movie corpus of Netflix. In addition, you know, the kinds of questions that we're asking, so about the components of life that we seek to discover, are becoming much more abstract, like, you know, what are the regulatory circuits of cells? So which protein really binds to which other protein or which gene up or down regulates which other gene? And we really need to understand this in order to develop drugs that can, you know, intervene or perturb the system and move a cell back from a disease state back to a health state. So consequently, many of the insights we most desire will be beyond, you know, unaided human comprehension. One, because the data sets are so huge that we cannot just, you know, easily go through all of them. And second, because the questions that we're asking are becoming much more abstract. And so in the same way that algorithms for chess and Go revealed, you know, entirely new strategies of gameplay, we will need new tools for actually really looking at these data sets. Now, fortunately, right, we all know that, you know, the last two decades have also witnessed not only a transformation in the life sciences, but of course, also in the data sciences. We are living in the golden age of AI and machine learning. We're relying on these algorithms every day. Probably, you know, you might have just done a, a Google search for something. Uh, you may have just bought something on Amazon, um, you know, watched a movie last night, looked for new suggestions for movies last night, maybe on Netflix and, you know, maybe ordered a car on Uber, right? So we're really relying on these machine learning and AI technologies day in and day out. And so there is a unique opportunity in converging these two um, technologies, so the biological technologies and, and the data, data technologies that we have seen, where we have seen these revolutions. Now, I'd like to, on this slide, just be also a bit more precise in terms of the data set sizes that are becoming available in biology. Um, so what you see here is that just the genomics platform alone at the Broad Institute, so this is a single institute, has generated about 80 petabytes of data this year. Okay, so that's, and you know, these are now the numbers that I'm getting from the internet. So if there's anyone from Twitter or Netflix, uh, feel free to correct me. So this is about the same size of data as what Twitter generated this year. And this is only the genomics platform at the Broad. So one research institute, only genomics, so not taking into account the imaging data, et cetera. In total, the Broad currently has about 100 petabytes of data under management. So compare this to the whole movie corpus of Netflix, which is about 60 petabytes of data. So we now have an urgent need for machine learning enthusiasts, data science enthusiasts, to work with biologists to really analyze this data and work on you know, really important problems for humanity to develop better treatments for diseases like cancer, which is what this competition here is about. 
Now, interestingly, even though the life sciences are quickly outgrowing, you know, really any other area in terms of data generation, it is still application areas like one online advertising, uh, recommender systems like Amazon, self-driving cars, robotics, that are the key drivers of foundational developments in machine learning and AI today. Now, in these applications, AI has been you know, hugely successful by directly optimizing prediction accuracy. Now, just prediction accuracy, unfortunately, is often not sufficient in biology, where we really need to understand the underlying mechanisms, right? As I explained, we would like to understand the circuits in a cell in order to be able to intervene in them and perturb them so that a cell moves back from, the, from a disease state back to a normal state. So, and this mechanistic or causal aspect is what we really want to get at in, in many biomedical questions. And in fact, this mechanistic or causal aspect is also really critical in cancer research and you know, in this data science challenge that we're organizing. So for this, we need to talk a bit about cancer. Um, so our bodies have a lot of mechanisms in place to control cell growth making sure the correct number of each cell type grows and that old cells die off. But sometimes those mechanisms fail and damaged cells start to multiply out of control, forming lumps, which we call tumors, and giving us or possibly giving us cancer. And so those cancer cells, as we know, right, in metastasis can also spread to other parts of the body. Now, Interestingly, you know, our immune system in principle can and knows how to attack, to first find and then attack cancer cells. But one of the hallmarks of cancer is that cancer cells are actually really skilled at evading the detection of the immune system. They're able to disarm the immune system. And we'll talk much more about this. Now, you know, given this background, it has become clear, and this is also what cancer research have, have been after in recent years, they have made a lot of progress in developing drugs that boost our own immune system so that our immune cells, in particular the soldiers of, of our immune system, the T cells, become effective again at killing the cancer cells. So this is known as cancer immunotherapy. For example, here is an example of a particular drug, a cancer immunotherapy drug, ipilimumab, um, has improved survival rates for patients with advanced melanoma, as you can see in this graph. Now, although this is actually considered a gold standard for this particular cancer, only 22% of people actually respond to the drug. So clearly, we need to develop you know, immunotherapy drugs that work for more people and, of course, also for more different types of cancer. So let's go into the challenges of immunotherapy and how we may be able to actually progress in immunotherapy. Now, as I had mentioned, one of the main challenges in cancer immunotherapy is that cancer cells disarm the soldiers of our immune system, the T cells. So how they do it is they send signals that make the, the, these soldiers really exhausted so that they cannot do their job properly anymore. So what we want to develop is therapies that can move these T cells from the exhausted malfunctioning state back to an effector state where they can bind to and attack and kill cancer cells. And so this is exactly the goal of this competition is to identify interventions in T cells or perturbations that can actually move a T cell from the exhausted state back to becoming very effective at killing T cells. So then the question is, how can we change the state of a T cell? Well, this is really exciting because gene editing technologies like CRISPR really allow us to go in and edit the genome. For example, we can remove a gene and this changes. So this is known as a gene knockout. And this changes the state of a cell because now, you know, this gene is not expressed anymore. Um, and so that will change the expression patterns of also all kinds of other genes and can move a T cell from one state to another state. So the problem is that humans have 20,000 genes, and so we could knock out any one of these genes and change the state of a cell in this way, or we could even do combinations of knockouts. So if we're thinking of just combinations of two knockouts, that's already 20,000 times 20,000, so 400 million different knockouts. And we're just not able to perform all of these knockouts. That's just too time consuming and expensive. 
So for this data, this, uh, data science challenge, what we have done is we have collected a very large scale single cell data set from tumors and mice, um, where we measure the expression of every gene, so that's 20,000 genes, in 100,000 T cells. Okay, so that's a matrix of 20,000 variables times 100,000 samples, um, which are single T cells. And in this data set, what we have done is performed 70 of these knockouts. So talked about how large the space of all possible knockouts is. So we've performed 70,000 knockouts of all possible, say 20,000 knockouts and T cells. And you'll get to see what actually these knockouts do. So how they move the state of a T cell. Um, so now from this data, the challenge is to predict the effect of all these other knockouts that we could have performed and identify novel knockouts that would be effective at killing cancer cells. And so really to do this, as you see here, right, we cannot perform all these experiments without clean algorithms of predicting which experiments we should be performing. And so we really need your algorithms for doing this. So um, we're holding this uh, cancer immunotherapy data science challenge through Top Coder, and we're very excited about this. And this is in partnership with the Broad Institute, with Harvard's Laboratory for Innovation Science, MIT's Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science, and um, Mass General Hospital. Um, and so now let me go a little bit deeper also in terms of what the challenge actually is. Um, so our cancer immunotherapy data science challenge um, will consist of three parts that will all run at the same time. Um, so in the first part, participants will predict the effect of um, perturbations or knockouts that have already been studied in the lab. So this allows challenge participants to actually see how well their algorithms work. Um, in part two, they'll come up with a metric for ranking how well a particular gene knockout would shift T cells to a desired state. And third, so in part three, given single cell data from T cells in a mouse tumor, participants will actually propose new knockouts that they predict would boost the T cells ability to actually destroy the cancer or the tumor. And here's something that we are particularly and really excited about. Unlike in most data science challenges, the top scorers from part one will actually have their predictions from part three. So their, their part three submissions really actually experimentally validated um, and checked whether these predicted knockouts actually boost the T cells ability to destroy the tumor. Now, note that biology background isn't needed to participate um, since the Eric and Wendy Schmidt Center will provide all challenge participants with a short online crash course on cancer biology and immunology, as well as a crash course on the unique features of the large scale single cell data sets. The Broad Institute is a global leader in biomedical research, um, in particular in these kinds of data sets, these genetic sequencing data sets. So this is a unique opportunity to learn from leading life science and computational biology experts. So the challenge will run um, from January 9 to February 3, 2023. Uh, so please mark your calendars. You can sign up as an individual or a team. We'll be giving out monetary prizes to the winners um, of each part of the challenge, totaling around 50,000 US dollars. Um, registration opens today, and we very much hope you will be signing up. We really look forward to your submissions um, to help us make cancer immunotherapy more effective for more patients and for more different types of cancers. So with this, um, thank you very much for your attention. And we really hope uh, you will be participating in this challenge.